If you're a construction project engineer or junior construction manager and have been asked to track and monitor progress on a construction site and have no idea how to do it, then this video is for you. We're going to look at how to track, monitor and control progress on a construction site to make sure the works are getting done as planned. And this video is part of a series of talks we're doing to equip construction project engineers and junior construction managers with the skills they need to thrive in their jobs. We're talking about project scheduling, but we're also going to be doing talks on quality management, design management, cost estimating, cost control, and procurement and contracts. And these are the core skills you're going to need to be able to excel at your job and accelerate your career. Before we get started, a little bit about us. My name's Tim, and I'm a senior project engineer with almost 10 years of experience in the industry. I've also done my PMP, so project management professionals, and I'm a chartered professional engineer in electrical engineering and project management. And I'm making these talks with my colleague, Ashley, who's a senior commercial manager and has over 15 years of experience in the industry. One thing we've both noticed in our careers is that how the people who excel at their jobs get promoted and build careers that they love are the ones who understand and master the fundamentals. And that's why we built a training academy, Construct IQ, to quickly, simply, and effectively teach the fundamental construction project management skills that you can build a career off. So far, we've helped over 20,000 students and 94% of students we've surveyed said that mastering these skills helped take their careers to the next level. This talk is part of a series of talks we're doing on construction project scheduling, and we're covering all of the core skills that you need to master. We've spoken about the basic concepts of scheduling, developing the schedule, implementing the plan, and now we're gonna be talking about how to track and monitor progress. Tracking and monitoring progress is all about making sure that we stay on track and then when we deviate from the plan, we put in place things to fix it. And in this talk, scheduling, monitoring and control, we're gonna be talking about tracking progress, progress reports, and what we can do when we deviate from the plan. So we'll be talking about treatments. To get started with, how do we track progress? Our schedule is a guess. It's an educated guess. It's a plan of how we think we're gonna do the project but it's based on assumptions. Assumptions like how much trenching we're gonna be getting done per day, what day the core materials are gonna arrive, and what day we're meant to hand over the building. The schedule will be wrong. No way are we gonna create a perfect plan that perfectly foresees everything that's gonna happen and estimates everything correctly. There's gonna be change, and there's gonna be unknown and unknowable circumstances that come up. That's why we need a way of making sure that we're sticking with the plan and when we're deviating from the plan, we're doing things to fix it. And that's what we use progress tracking for. Progress tracking is an important tool to keep the schedule relevant and useful, keep our stakeholders engaged and informed, and identify potential issues as early on as possible. So the first real benefit of tracking progress is keeping the schedule relevant. I can't tell you the number of times I worked on construction projects and you look at the master project schedule and it just doesn't reflect the way things are being done in actuality. And it loses its relevance as a tool that you can use to schedule and coordinate the works. The number one way we can ensure this doesn't happen and keep the schedule relevant is by tracking progress and reporting on progress accurately. We need to be able to use the schedule to plan activities, book resources and coordinate the works. And if the schedule is wrong and the schedule is not updated, then it's not a useful tool for doing this. So I wanna go through a really, really simple case study to show you a way you'd use the schedule and why you need to update progress to use it as a tool to schedule and coordinate the works. So say we're managing an electrical project and the cable installation can only begin once the conduits have been installed. If the conduit install is 10% complete, but the schedule says it should be 90% complete. So we're at 10% and we're meant to be at 90%. And the cable installation is planned to commence next week, but the cable procurement's been delayed. So we're in a situation where we're meant to start cable install next week, but our cable delivery is being delayed. 
However, we're also meant to be 90% complete on Conduit install, but we're only 10%. So these are real circumstances. These are the types of situations that you'll be dealing with as a construction project manager. And you've got to answer the question, should we pay an expedited delivery fee to make sure the cable gets here next week so we can get the cable installed? Should we do it? Well, we need to use the schedule to answer this question. We need to understand the different activity durations does it make sense to start cable install when conduit install is only 10% complete? Are the activities on the critical path? What happens if all these activities are delayed? Then we can also begin to come up with more questions. Can we get extra resources to do the conduit installation? Is it worth getting extra resources? Does it actually matter if the cable install is delayed? You can see how this information and a relevant schedule can help us make better decisions as construction project managers and helps us coordinate and manage the works better. The schedule also helps us keep our stakeholders informed. It helps us keep them up to date and aware of what's happening on site. And an informed stakeholder, in my experience, is often a happy stakeholder. If we let the community know what days we're going to be closing the road and disrupting them and we give them weeks and weeks notice, then they're able to plan and mitigate the impact on them. On top of this, it's also a contractual requirement. In construction contracts and our contract with the client, it'll say in the contract that we need to develop and maintain a program. And then we need to keep them up formed at regular intervals. So every week, every two weeks, we'll need to update them and send them an updated schedule. And this is their way of checking that they're happy with the way things are progressing. And to do this, to keep our stakeholders informed, to keep our client informed, we need to provide them accurate, and realistic information. We need to be able to tell them how far through procurement we are. We need to be able to tell them what percentage complete we are with piloting. And the final benefit of progress tracking is that it gives us a lead indicator. What is a lead indicator? A lead indicator is an indication that something's gonna go wrong before it happens. This is the opposite of a lag indicator. So a lag indicator is being made aware of something after the fact that it's happened. Why do we care about lead indicators? Well, because we can change the trajectory of the course. We can look at the data. We can look at that we're 10% through conduit install and we should be 90% through. And we can make decisions about how to correct the course and how to change things for the better. So if piling is 10% complete in week one and we've got a four week duration to do it, and we, so we really should be at 25% complete, we can do something at week one to change the course of actions rather than waiting till week four when we realize that we don't finish piling based on the planned date. And if we weren't tracking progress, we wouldn't know this. If we didn't know how many piles we'd installed versus how many we should, we wouldn't know that we're off course in week one until we missed the finish date in week four. To define progress tracking, it's basically working out an accurate percentage of how complete each task in our schedule is. That's really all it is. We wanna come up with a way to come up with an accurate percentage of each task's completion. What activities do we track? Well, they're the activities from the master project schedule. These are the activities we're gonna be reporting on to our client, to the project controls team, and to project management. So we'll need to be able to read and interpret the master project schedule and look at the way the activities are structured, and these are the activities we're gonna be reporting on. Tracking progress occurs in three stages. We need to number one, understand the activity we're tracking. Number two, we need to set up a progress tracker. So this is a structure for how we're gonna collect the data. And then number three, we need to actually collect the data. So we need to monitor progress and fill out our progress tracker while the activity is being completed. So number one, understanding the activity we're gonna be tracking. So there's two types of activities we're gonna be tracking. These are the production driven activities and the milestone-driven activities. So what's a production-driven activity? A production-driven activity is an activity that has a baseline quantity that accurately reflects the progress through it. And this quantity directly reflects the completion of the work. So for example, trenching. The lineal meters of trenching completed is a quantity that can be used to measure how complete the, the trenching is. So if to do a one kilometer trench, we've done 200 meters, the activity is 20% complete. Piling, if we have to do 100 piles, we've done 10, the activity is 10% complete. So there's a quantity that can be used to measure how complete the task is. This is different to milestone activities. 
A milestone-driven activity is an activity that is a set of sub-activities with no consistent metric or baseline quantity to track. So for example, if we're trying to track procurement, there's not a unifying metric that we can use that represents all the different stages of procurement. There's not something like number of words written, like these would sort of be meaningless metrics that wouldn't actually represent how complete the task is. But if you look at what procurement involves, we need to prepare a tender package. We need to send that tender package for quotes. We need to get quotes from suppliers. We need to assess these and make a recommendation. Then we need to get internal approvals. Then we have to negotiate and sign a contract. You can see it's a set of all these different subtasks. Once we've understood the type of activity we're tracking, the next step is to set up a progress tracker. So we need to determine the structure we're using to track the activity. So whether it's milestone driven or schedule driven, we need to get a quantity from the design, if it's a production driven task, and then we need to determine the planned quantity over time. At what dates should we be at what percentages? Basically, that's what that means. So let's look at an example of this for a production driven activity. So the activity we're tracking, and we've used this as an example in some of our other talks for the street lighting works on a road project. If we've got to do pits, conduits, and foundations in zone eight, and we know we've got a unit of measure, so lineal meters can be used for conduit foundations. And then because we're also tracking pit installation and foundations, we want to convert this lineal meter metric into an equivalent for pits and an equivalent for foundations. So if we say installing a pit is equivalent to 20 meters of conduit or installing one foundation is equivalent to 60 meters of conduit. And the easiest way to do this would be to say, if we install 20 meters per shift, it takes us one shift to install a pit, then we could use 20 meters as an equivalent for a pit install. And the reason I've broken it down like this and I'm using this as an example is because a lot of the time when you're tracking activities, they're not all going to be exactly the same where you can use one consistent metric. So we've come up with our activities to be tracked, the pit conduits and foundations, the supply installed the lights, which we're tracking per pole, the supply and installed the distribution boards, which we're tracking per distribution board, and the supply and installed the circuits, which we're going to track per circuit. We then want to take, go to our design drawings and work out the design quantity. So what's the total quantity of work we need to do? So for pits, conduits and foundations, 7,350 meters. And we use that conversion of 20 meters per pit and 60 meters per light pole foundation to come up with that figure. For the supply and install of the light poles, we've got 45 poles. For the supply and install of the distribution board, we've got one distribution board. And for the supply and install of the circuits, we've got 123 separate circuits to put in. All right, so next we wanna take the total quantity of work, the number of shifts we have to do the task from the project schedule and convert these into a daily target we have to hit to meet our program. So for example, pits, conduits, and foundations, we have to do 7,350 meters, and we've got 75 shifts. This gives us a daily target of 98 meters. For the light poles, we've got 45 light poles, 20 shifts to do the task. We have a target of 2.25 poles per shift. We then can put all this information into some sort of Excel spreadsheet that has our activity, our plan target, our planned cumulative, so the target each day, and then we sum these together each day to get our cumulative target. Then we've got our actual, so each day we go out and physically measure how much work we've done. We then get our cumulative actual, and then we get our total remaining. And this information together is going to give us the information we need to know to accurately report on where the task is up to versus where it should be. So that example was for a production or productivity driven activity. We've got an accurate baseline quantity we can measure. We now need to do this for a milestone driven task. So these are the tasks where it's really a set of sub activities. So to track one of these activities, we need to determine the milestones, set up a rule of credit system, and then monitor our performance against the rule of credit system that we set up. So the same as we did for a production driven activity, we're gonna go through a quick example and we'll use procurement as an example of a milestone driven activity. So step one, we need to determine the milestones. So what are the milestones for procurement? The tender package is ready, step one. The tender is issued to the market, step two. We've received quotes, step three. We've awarded a contract and step five, we're mobilized the site and ready to start the works. Against these milestones, we wanna put rules of credit. So a rule of credit is basically saying if the whole task is 100%, we're going to allocate a percentage to each of these steps. And this percentage reflects how far through the work we actually are. And 
I mean, obviously, this is going to take a little bit of guessing and assumptions, but generally, we want the rule of credit system to reflect time. So if we're 10% of the way through the work, we should be about 10% of the time through. For our procurement example, we've got tender package ready, that's 10%. The tender's been issued to the market, we'll give that 20%. Quotes received, when we've received the quotes for the market, we'll then 50% of the way through procurement. When we've awarded the contract, 75%. And when the subcontract is mobilized, the site ready to start the works, that's 100% procurement done. And again, these percentages are always going to be a little bit different and take a little bit of like guesswork and interpretation. But we want to do it in a way that makes sense for the project. So this will, we want to try and use some sort of logic to weight the tasks. And the way to do that is we really want to weight them based on the level of effort or the duration. So if it's, for example, in procurement process, we give one week to prepare the tender and two weeks for the subcontractors to provide quotes, then what we allocate preparing the tender package should be worth half what is worth for quoting. So say preparing the tender package is 10%, quoting should be worth 20%. Then based on the stage we are through the activity, we can estimate the percentage complete if we've set up a rule of credit system. It's much more subjective than a quantity driven task. And at the end of the day, the better the metric we come up with and better the percentage weightings we give the tasks, the more accurate the project's going to be. So for example, if we say we're 30% of the way through procurement, that's obviously heavily subjective on what we define 30% to be. Okay, so, so far we've understood the activity we're tracking, so we know whether it's a milestone driven task versus a quantity driven task, and we've set up a progress tracker with an accurate rule of credit system or and understanding the baseline quantity. Final step in progress tracking is to go out and actually record the data. This means measuring how much trenching is that each day, knowing exactly where we're up to with procurement, knowing what status the design drawings are, obviously it depends on the task we're tracking. And so your job as a project engineer is to set up a system for how you actually record and document this information. Then what do we do with this information? That's where we're gonna get into progress reporting. Progress reporting is what we do with the information we've gathered, how we summarize it, what metrics we calculate it, and who we send it to. We want to report on the information we've tracked to the project manager and project controls team. We want to calculate some key performance metrics. We want to find key metrics that represent progress, and we want to set up an earned value management system. So there's a couple of key metrics we need to calculate to accurately make the data we've calculated make sense and be able to inform meaningful decisions. The first one is the percentage complete. So what percentage complete we are for the task? That's really simple. It's just the work complete divided by the total quantity. So we've done 100 meters of trenching, the total quantity is 1,000, we're 10% complete. The next is our production rate. So this is where we take the quantity complete divided by the elapsed time. So if we've got to do, we've done 100 meters of trenching in five days, our production rate is 20 meters per day. Then we want to calculate our schedule variance. This is where we take the difference between how much work we've done versus what we should be. So if we're meant to have done 200 meters of trenching, we've only done 100, our schedule variance is 100 meters. We're 100 meters behind track. We could also have done 300 meters and we're only meant to do 200 meters. Then we've got a positive schedule variance and we're ahead of track. From this, we can then create a schedule performance index. And this is a number that tells us whether we're above or below track. And this number is comparable for all tasks. So rather than just saying we're 100 meters behind trenching, it gives us a rate that we're behind. And you could use this same schedule performance index to compare across activities. So you can make a comparison between scheduling and piling. So the schedule performance index is calculated by taking the earned value and dividing it by the planned value. So we said we're gonna do 200 meters of trenching and we've done 200 meters of trenching, our schedule performance index is one. If we've done 300 meters of trenching and we said we're gonna do 200, our schedule performance index is 1.5. That's really good. A schedule performance index greater than one shows we're ahead of track. On the other hand, if we're planned on doing 200 meters, we've only done 100, then our schedule performance index is 0.5. If the number is less than one, it's a bad sign. It shows we're behind track. And you can calculate the same metric for different activities. And then we can calculate our estimated completion date. This is basically a forecast completion date based on the current production we're going at. So this is where we take the current date we're at and we add to it the work remaining divided by the production rate. Okay, 
So we've got a thousand meters of trenching to do. We've done a hundred. We've got 900 meters left to go. Our current production rate is 20 meters per day. That gives us 45 days remaining to complete the trenching. Our forecast completion date is today plus 25 working days. Remember, you have to factor in the schedule calendar, whether we're working five shifts a week or whether we're working 20. It really depends on calendar and your site access. But these are the key metrics that will tell us for an activity, how we're going against our plan, what our production rate is, whether we're performing above or below the plan and what our forecast finish date is. Let's do a really, really simple example of a solar farm. We're installing inverters. We've got a total quantity of 100. We've got a plan of doing four per day and we have an estimated duration of therefore 25 days. And let's say at day 10, we've installed 25 inverters. Let's calculate the key metrics. So for our 10 day, our day 10 progress report, our percentage complete is 25%. Our production is 25 inverters across 10 days, which is 2.5 inverters per day. Our schedule variance is we've done 25, we should have done 40, so we're 15 inverters behind track. Our schedule performance index is we've done 25 divided by 40, which is 0.625. So we're behind track, that's bad. We want it to be one or above, remember. And then our estimated completion date is then 75, the number of inverters we have left, divided by the number of we're doing per day, which is 2.5, which is 30. So add that on to day 10, where our estimated completion date is day 40. So to summarize, we're 15 inverters behind schedule. We've gone from a 25 day program to a 40 day program, and we're at 62.5% of planned production. Overall, when we're looking at this in terms of time, we're doing pretty badly. And this leads on to the next question, what can we do about it? When we look at what we can do about it, we have to remember that we've collected all this information. We've set up a progress tracker. The only value this information has is if we use it to make meaningful decisions and change things. Therefore, we need to understand treatments and what we can do if works are delayed. And we wanna understand our options and choose the right treatment for the right problem. So when choosing a treatment to apply or understanding what to do in an activity's delay, we first wanna understand the type of activity being delayed. We next identify the cause of the delay. So what's actually causing us to be behind progress. And then we wanna explore our options for what we can do about the delay. So there's two categories of activities that can be delayed, critical path and non-critical path. The critical path activities, as I've already spoken about, are the activities that if delayed, delay project completion. The non-critical path activities have float. This means there's an amount of time referred to as float that an activity can be delayed before it pushes out our completion date. Once we've worked out if the activity we're looking at is a critical path activity or a non-critical path activity, we can begin to look at the causes of the delay. There are so many different activities on a construction project. We've got procurement activities, construction, pre-construction, testing. It's impossible to come up with a one methodology for determining a cause. There's lots of different factors that can play in and result in an activity being delayed. There's things like resource constraints, planning and scheduling issues, project management issues, technical factors, external factors, and stakeholder approvals. All of these things can contribute to an activity being delayed. We need to review all of these possible factors and understand the causes so that we can work out what to do about it. And there's two options we can use to address the delay. There's the option to optimize and improve, and there's the option to add cost or risk. So optimize and improve. That's where we talk about improving the systems and performance and addressing the easy to address root causes. And effectively we wanna try and optimize the delivery methodology. On the other hand, there's the options that add cost and risk. So we can add additional resources. In project management, this is referred to as crashing, or we can overlap activities. We can start activities in parallel rather than doing them in sequence. And this adds risk. This is referred to as fast tracking. When it's a critical path activity, delaying this activity delays project completion. Therefore, we should look at all treatments. We should look at optimizing and improving the delivery methodology, but we should also be willing to add cost and add risk to the project to speed it up. However, if the activity has float, then we don't wanna go spending money to accelerate it. We can just eat into the float. Obviously, if an activity is super close to the critical path and only has a little bit of float, maybe we treat it like a critical path activity. But we really wanna only add cost and risk 
if an activity is on the critical path or near the critical path. This now brings us to the responsibilities of a construction project engineer or junior construction manager in tracking, monitoring, and controlling progress. Number one is reporting. You wanna be calculating these key metrics, setting up systems to track progress, setting up a progress tracker, and for every activity you're managing, knowing exactly what the percentage complete is, exactly what the plan finish date is, what the scheduled performance index is. And you wanna be feeding this information back to the project manager and project controls team. And so this is to help them maintain the master project schedule and get meaningful information to the senior leadership team. Next, you wanna use this information to regularly maintain and update your short range program. So your three week look ahead should constantly be looking at different activities that you've got planned, how they're tracking, how they're versing the plan. And you wanna use this to maintain relevance and use it as a coordination tool, but also communicate progress to subcontractors and stakeholders but also to make changes. For example, if you can allocate more resources to an activity without adding cost, if that one activity is behind, you're better off doing that. But it's also gonna help you coordinate and plan the works so as best to achieve the master project schedule and project objectives. With the information you've collected, your job, and when things start to slip, is to maintain progress. So you wanna be using this information when activities slip, to identify treatments, what can you do to correct it, and put in place these treatments. From the very beginning of the project, don't let things slip. If your target is 20 meters a day, do everything you can to make sure you meet this target. You don't wanna be rushing at the end to meet deadlines. From the very start, as soon as activities slip, you wanna be identifying treatments and putting them in place and implementing them. And this is how you're gonna use tracking and monitoring progress to deliver the project in accordance with the schedule. So to summarize, tracking, monitoring, and controlling progress. What did we cover? We covered tracking progress and the methodology for how to set up a progress tracker and how to set up systems to accurately record the completion of the works. We talk about progress reports and the key metrics you should be calculating to understand what stage of works something's up to. We then spoke about treatments. So when an activity falls behind track, what you have to do to get it back on track. And then we spoke about the specific project engineer responsibilities. I really hope you got something out of this video. And again, we're doing a series of talks on construction project engineering and construction management. By understanding the basics, you can take your career to the next level. We're gonna be covering scheduling, procurement and contracts, quality, design management, estimating and cost control. And these tools are gonna to be your project engineering toolkit that you're gonna use as a foundation to build your career. If you did enjoy the video and you want to take more time to master the fundamentals, then we have a series of courses on construction project management at our website, Construct IQ, and I'll add the link to the description.